The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Combating Dilation in the Continuum, Varmint Hunters test slingshots equipped with ultra-massive time-slowed stones to discourage those pesky garbage-rating sloths. First, bourgeoisie space tourist nicknamed the Out There Au Pair. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we interview Les Johnson on his new solo debut novel, Mission to Methany. This is a great big idea, sense of wonder, science fiction novel about an Earth mission sent to investigate an artifact in the outer solar system. They're going to a moon of Saturn that looks curiously like a spacecraft, which the moon Methany actually does. Les will tell us lots more about that soon. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. First, here's the news. We have some great fiction and non-fiction for your reading pleasure this month. These are up at Bain.com right now, and they will be up until the Ides of March. Wherewith we will summon Brutus and the Senate to surround them and gently place them into ebook form, where you can still read them. Long live the Republic! At the Bain.com front page now is An Eagle's Flight by the great mystery and science fiction short story writer Brendan Du Bois. It was the big day. NASA specialist Walt Sinclair should have been in the control room with the rest of the engineers, programmers, and flight specialists. But instead, Walt was stuck babysitting Oscar Marrow, a pilot from back in the old days. Oscar was something of a celebrity around Mission Control, one of the few from his era still left alive. But that didn't make Walt any happier, about being stuck in a windowless office listening to the public broadcast over an old static-filled radio while Oscar dozed. But though the promise of tomorrow belongs to the youth, Walt soon learns that the past holds valuable lessons. Lessons that can't be run in a simulator. Also at Bain.com, right now for your reading enjoyment, is a nonfiction piece, Every Seven Minutes, by Dr. Robert E. Hampson, our resident neuroscientist. The dream sequence has been a staple of short stories, novels, television, and motion pictures for years. And of course, we all play out our own dream sequences on the back of our eyelids every night, even if we don't remember them upon waking. But for all of our familiarity with dreams, both real and the fictional variety, most of us don't really know what dreams are or how they work. Here, Dr. Hampson breaks down the whys and wherefores of our dreams and discusses how authors might use the science of dreams in their fiction. Every Seven Minutes by Dr. Robert E. Hampson and An Eagle's Flight by Brendan Du Bois are both available at Bain.com and will be available for an eternity of fun in the ebook collections Free Nonfiction 2018 and Free Stories 2018 at Bain eBooks. I want to welcome Les Johnson to the podcast. Back to the podcast. Hi, Les. Hi, Tony. I think that your your actual uh, science jobs and space scientist jobs have changed. Um, Somewhat over the last year or so, we may not even have an up-to-date bio here at Bain that that really encompasses what you're what you're up to. Can you tell us a little bit about that side of your uh, of um, of your um, accomplishments and what you've been doing lately? Um, give us an update. Yeah, I'll be glad to. Well, first and foremost, um, until it flies and actually until it reaches its target asteroid, I'm still serving as the NASA uh, propulsion lead in our uh, lingo, I guess you call it the principal investigator for the NASA Near-Earth Asteroid Scout Solar Sail mission. That'll be launching in 2019 and using a solar sail propulsion system, which basically is a big sail that reflects sunlight for thrust, to take a small spacecraft to do a survey of an asteroid. It'll take about two and a half years to get there and send the science data back. But that's, uh, that's my primary activity uh, in my day job. And I'm also in what's called the uh, formulation office. And in that capacity, I'm actually on the uh, upfront side 
uh, looking at all the applications and the technologies required to actually field our first nuclear thermal uh, propulsion system that might be used to send robots to the outer solar system and eventually send people to Mars. So that's that's what I'm I'm spending my day to do doing, and I have to I have to be real clear that I can't uh, speak for NASA in any way when I'm talking about my books, and I have to keep all my book writing totally separate. But just wanted to let folks know that's what I've, I'm doing in my day job. Sure, some of the but you do have an extensive knowledge of solar sails that sometimes leaks into your <laughs> your work, perhaps. Oh, it does, it does, and and that's okay. Um, I I have to admit, I, I became a fan of solar sails back when I, I first read uh, the Moat in God's Eye by Niven and Pornell about the laser sailing aliens, and it's a real, I don't know, it's kind of cool for a science fiction fan like myself to actually be working on a solar sail propulsion system and all that. And it did creep in to, to my latest book, Mission to Methoni. In fact, the opening chapter really reflects what I view as the future of the technology. Well, I mean, you're, it sounds like to me that you've, I mean, your primary con- concentration over your, your science career has been propulsion systems of various sorts that m- would be used in space. Is that a good characterizing of it? Or Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm a I am absolutely a propulsion technologist, but not a rocket scientist. I don't really do a whole lot with conventional rockets. That's chemical propulsion. That's, uh, mm-hmm. that's really good for getting us off the planet. But it, in my opinion, that's 1960s technology, with no offense to my colleagues. We need to be looking at the next generation <laughs> systems, the stuff that's going to take us to the outer solar system and beyond. And that, that's really where my heart is, and that's where my, my professional day has, has been focused. Yeah. So actually, what you're saying is you're smarter than a rocket scientist, but we won't say that. Not at all. I just think differently. You know, they, you know we've got to have rockets to get off the ground or else we won't get into space. We're going to need those for the foreseeable future, and we need the cost to come down. And there are a lot of people a lot smarter than me working on ways to make that happen. But that's still the, only the first 300 miles. I want to take us the next $3 billion. And And for that, you yeah. need something that's a lot more efficient than a rocket. Yeah. Well, uh, you're, to get to the science fiction side, uh, we'll, I'd like to talk more about um, some of the technology as we talk about the book. Uh, Les is also the author with Ben Bova of Rescue Mode. Um, with Travis S. Taylor, he's the author of novels Back to the Moon and On to the Asteroid. Uh, his popular science book, Graphene, the super strong, super thin, and super versatile material that will revolutionize the world, with uh, co-author Joe Meany, uh, whose whose work has also appeared on Bain.com, is out this month as well. Um, and out now at Booksellers is the world's first Les Johnson solo novel, um, I think, and it's a really good one. The spirit of Arthur C. Clarke and his contemporaries is alive and well in Johnson's first contact novel, Publishers Weekly says. Excellent review. That book is called Mission to Methany. Um, so... Uh, well, let's talk about the book for a moment then. What 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 the heck is methany? Um, that was my first thought when you submitted when you came up with that title. Well, I like the alliteration of the title, but it's caused me no end of grief because on the tour and talking to people selling, talking about the book, I, I've gotten everything from mission to methane to mission to methadone. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, I, have, I have to admit I've had second thoughts about the title, but methony is a moon of Saturn. And if you uh, Google it or, or look up and see some pictures of it, the first thing you'll notice is it looks like a big, uh, a big egg. It looks like a big solar system scale egg. It's white. It's uh, uh, oval shaped like an egg, and it, it's kind of fluffy looking. But when you when you burrow into it, you find out uh, at least what we know about the the science returned from it is it is the least dense moon in the solar system with a density of about one third that of water. And so from a science point of view, everyone's scrambling trying to figure out what this is and what, what its composition might be because we don't have a lot of data about it. it. It wasn't discovered until 2004 by the NASA Cassini orbiter, which was in orbit around Saturn. And that's why not many people have heard of it. It's, it's, it's kind of small. It's only about two miles long, and we don't have a lot of data about it. Now, for me, though, when I hear the least dense moon in the solar system, uh, in my day job, I'm thinking it ought to be scientifically interesting, but in the back of my head, I'm thinking, wow, you know, I wonder if that could be a, a hollow alien spaceship for a story. So yeah. uh, that's that's why it popped to my head about a an interesting destination. 
Yeah. What? Um, just to to digress for a moment. What? What other objects in the solar system have similar densities? Are there any? Is I mean, just to, I'm just not to aware of any. Some. Quite frankly, yeah. no, I'm not. I'm not aware of anything that's even close to this um, this low in density. There may be some. Maybe I'm not a planetary a scientist. Left. <laughs> no, don't, let's not feed any conspiracy theories out there. I, you know, I can't speak for NASA as to what this is other than a naturally right, yeah. occurring object. But, you know, in my imagination, you can do whatever you want, right? And that's, that's, that's where the essence of this becoming a destination came from is in my imagination, I'm thinking, wow, uh, this is really curious. I wonder what else it could be. Well, talk a little bit about the genesis of the book, um, because... It, it, it really does have that uh, Clarkian feel to it. Um, how did you, how did the, uh, how did it all start with you um, to write Mission to Method? Well, it came together in many, many parts. Part of it has been my long desire to play with the notion of, you know, are we alone in the universe? We, we, we've got the, the, the paradox of, of well, Fermi's paradox, where we, we look out into space and we see our technology advancing and we realize that it's only a matter of a thousand years or more that we're going to start sending robotic probes, a thousand years or less, hopefully, robotic probes to other stars. And eventually we're going to spread out among the rest of the galaxy. And we've seen no evidence that there's other life out there. I mean, the SETI, uh, listening for radio signals has come up dry. Uh, we don't have any indication that there's anybody else out there. And given the number of planets that the Kepler telescope has found circling other stars and all the radio astronomy, you have to wonder, well, why not? Why are we alone? And that, I, I don't know about the listeners to the podcast, but I would assume I'm not the only person that when you think about that, it, you have trouble going to sleep at night uh, because it's it's really great, one of the great unanswered questions. So I've always wanted to, to play with that notion in a story and, and maybe come up with some plausible explanations for why or why not we might have seen contact out there. And so that, that's a part of it. Um, but the story really kicked off, and you mentioned my day job, uh, it kicked off in a, in a meeting at work in my head. We were, uh, for this solar sail mission that I'm working on, we were doing what's called risk management. And it's exactly what it sounds like. We, we, we have fun at first. This is two years ago or so, two and a half years ago, coming up with all the things that can go wrong that would cause the mission to fail. And so you get a bunch of engineers in the room, and believe me, they can be creative in terms of experience and guessing as to what could go wrong. And we come up with this big list. Then you have to rank them in terms of what's most likely versus what's the highest consequence. So you know which are the ones you really have to go worry about. If it's something extremely unlikely, and it doesn't really matter if it happens or not, because uh, the whole mission won't fail, you don't worry about it. But if it's something that's got a high probability, and if it happens, the mission's over, you color it red, and you have to figure out a plan to mitigate it. So we were in this meeting, and one of the uh, trajectory analysts who looks at the flight path for the spacecraft to go to the asteroid that's our target and he said, you know, there's a really small chance that this asteroid, which has uh, got a really exciting name of 1991 VG after the year it was discovered. But he said, there's a small chance this is actually a Saturn V upper stage that was kicked into solar orbit during the Apollo program. And so we're all looking at him saying, what? And he said, oh, yeah, it's a fraction of a percent chance, but there's a possibility we'll get out there with our spacecraft and the camera and we'll see USA. <laughs> Well, everybody in the room kind of chuckled, and he said, but it's a really low probability, so we really shouldn't worry about it. It's just an outside chance. And I should point out that since that time, we've done a radio radar uh, assessment of the asteroid, and we realize it's not, it's not. It's really a rock. But at the time, everyone else kind of laughed and went back to the risk management meeting. But I totally zoned out because in my mind, I'm thinking, gee, what if we encounter this thing or somebody encounters this thing, and it's, it's not one of our old spacecraft. It's somebody else's. What if it's been around for 50,000 years and it looks dead? So in my mind, I'm totally zoned out at that point. I went home that night and made a few notes, and it wasn't long after that, Tony, that I, I contacted you to pitch the idea. So uh, just so the taxpayers out there know that 
I wasn't doing any work on my own time. I was only zoned out <laughs> about 15 minutes before the meeting ended, and then I went home and wrote everything down. But it really came out of that plus my my fascination with the with the uh, the whole "Are we alone?" concept. Yeah. The all right. So asteroids. Um, the book starts with asteroid mining, and you've written about them uh, with Travis and uh, with uh, a big asteroid, a big ass asteroid coming straight for Earth. Um, and inside, and you've written some articles for the website as well about this. Um, what? Uh, just sort of maybe talk about why we would be out there in the first place, uh, and and set up the beginning of the book when Chris, uh, Chris looks at the cameras, um, or the, he gets the reports of the camera anomalies and, and has to, to leave his dinner because something's come up. The, the, the future of space exploration, in my opinion, has never been brighter. I think it's as exciting now as it probably was at, at the, the, the years of the Apollo program with, with the interest of these private space companies and all that. But there are companies out there that are putting forth business cases for actually mining asteroids, primarily for water at this point, and using that to turn into hydrogen and oxygen for refueling satellites in high Earth orbit, the geostationary Earth orbit satellites. And if you're looking at uh, where we may be going in the future, I believe that we'll have hotels in orbit very soon that ultra wealthy people at least will, will pay to go visit. Um, we may have a, a moon base that's an international moon village, and those places will need to be regularly resupplied with water and supplies. Some of those come from the Earth, but that's expensive because you have to get out of the gravity well, and there have been a lot of studies that show that you might actually be able to do these resupply missions more affordably by mining the asteroids and sending any water or particu particular minerals directly to the moon base or to some of these Earth-orbiting satellites. And so in the book, I postulate that, you know, by the year 2068 or so, we'll have a robust economic zone in, in Earth orbit and out to the moon and beyond where people are actually making money off of extraterrestrial resources. I think that's possible. So that's really the setup for the, the spacefaring culture at the beginning of, of the novel and is why they're sending out this company that uh, Chris Holt works for is sending out these robotic probes to find asteroids that might be promising for mining and making money. And that's why he's out looking at the, at the results from these surveys, these assay missions. Yeah. Prospecting as it were, you know, absolutely. 20, 21st century yeah. prospecting. Yeah. And he's on earth as, as the story begins, these are robot probes. Um, and I mean, it's, I don't think it's really a spoiler since, you know, we say it on the back. <laughs> That they find something that's that's uh, that's of interest. Um, what what happens? Um, well, and, and that's where I, I hope to to draw the reader in because you know if if there actually has been some kind of uh, a probe that's that's from another civilization, perhaps something that's not made on Earth that's been out there for a long time, fifty thousand years. That's a long, 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 long time, right? That predates pretty much human civilization, not predating humanity, sure, but predates our records. Years. Yeah, <laughs> predates our, our, our records of civilization anyway. And um, yeah. so, so, you know, so I started thinking about, well, why would something be sitting there untouched for 50,000 years? And uh, I started thinking about the civilization that might be capable of traveling between the stars and how they would do that. And of course, I don't believe there'd be anyone living, nothing biological living and something that's been around and dormant for that long. But there might very well be some kind of artificial intelligence, uh, some, some kind of future version of what we're developing now with AI. And uh, perhaps that might be something there and, and it has been minding the store all that time. And then I had, I don't want to give anything away about the ultimate plot, but then I had to wonder well, why hasn't whoever sent it come back? Why haven't we had other visitors? If there's been one, why aren't there more? And yeah. and that sets well, you, up the, the the potential answer to the to the question of are we alone? Yeah, I think you per, you you do provide that um, the speculation on that in the book, and it's the uh, what's um, who's the scientist that that made the uh, 
the uh, the famous statement about this was it where are you talking about Enrico Fermi? Yeah, Enrico yeah, Fermi. He was Fermi a fascinating character. character. Yeah, he was a physicist that was a part of the Manhattan Project to build uh, the world's first atomic bomb, and he was out in Los Alamos with all the other famous physicists of the era. And uh, Fermi was – gosh, I need to write a quick biopic for your website on Fermi. He was great at estimating things. In his head, for example, he, he figured out within like a factor of two, how many piano tuners uh, were listed in the yellow pages for Chicago in the 1940s based on the population of Chicago. And he assumed how many houses would have a piano, how many of those would have a piano that needed tuning and how many of those people had a piano that needed tuning that could afford a tuner and just did some rough order estimates. And he came really close to the actual number of piano tuners <laughs> listed in the yellow book, yellow pages. So, I mean, he could, he could, he could look at a big problem and very quickly, come up with really good estimates of things. And when he looked at the, uh, the rate of our, our, our civilization and uncovering the secrets of the atom and the kind of spacecraft we'd be able to build in the future and how big the universe is and how old it is, in his mind, we should have been visited many times by uh, sentient species from other stars in the history of the planet. Um, and, and he looked up and said, it makes no sense that there's no evidence that anyone's ever been here. And for him, uh, it was just really a, a chilling thought because his power of estimation said there should have been many and we should see evidence of their past been here, and we haven't. Yeah. Maybe they just don't think that our pianos are worth tuning. But I guess anyway. Well, you come up with it. You posit uh, perhaps reasons for that that are, that are kind of chilling and compelling in the book. But we'll... We'll leave that. Um, so tell us a little bit about Chris. Now, when you first, you gave me the first draft of this, I was a little put off, you know, put off by Chris's character. And then you went back and developed it, and I understood him much better. Um, you've written uh, uh, a guy who's uh, who's a sort of highly functioning autistic fellow, right? Writer, I was extremely gratified that the reviewer in Publishers Weekly picked up on that and actually made that comment in, in the review because nowhere in the book do I use the word autism or have anyone say that he's uh, high functioning on, on the autism spectrum. And I hate that term high functioning, um, but I don't know what yeah, other way to describe I mean, while it. While I was coming out of my, while it was coming out of my yeah. mouth, I was like, man, that sounds like a derogatory. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's commonly used. And I think it's, it's, it's just, I, I just don't like it. I think it's kind of, not the best term, and you're not the only one who uses it. I find myself slipping into that. But what what, what I wanted to write is is a character who uh, can be successful and uh, do great things with some of the challenges that that uh, that people who um, are on the autism spectrum face. Because our world, for those on the spectrum, and I've encountered that for in a variety of uh, personal life circumstances. Um, they they view the world very differently than, than you and I do, and it's very challenging. The social interactions, understanding the cues, getting along with people, and and they're often they are often misunderstood by those around them as being maybe aloof or a little bit abrasive, when in fact uh, in in their own minds they're working really hard to be liked and, and communicate well, and it's just a challenge. And I, I wanted to. Um, I wanted to have the, the, the hero in this story be someone who overcomes those challenges and, and strives to be better understood. And I wanted the reader to kind of get in their head and understand that if they came across a little different from, you know, your average interaction, it wasn't because they were trying to be that way. It was because they, they struggle with those human interactions. And, and it, it takes a lot of effort. So I was really gratified that the reviewer picked up on that. I, I was, I guess my great disappointment yeah. would have been if, if people read it and nobody got it. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you do an excellent. You, you do a wonderful job of doing a subtle characterization of Chris with this. Um, with this. And it's because we're in his point of view a lot of the way, or all the way, is it, we feel what he's feeling when he makes a mistake that he didn't, you know, that he just didn't see coming. He's been working so hard to, to, you know, to, 
to not piss anybody off, to, to not say anything that would uh, that would uh, people would misinterpret, and then then something pops out, and we're like, oh, Chris, oh man, and we feel for the guy, right? So because I, I think that is that's the challenge that is faced. And I hope that uh, readers will get a, a better understanding of that and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe help us all be a little bit more understanding when we encounter people who have those difficulties. Yeah, sure. And it's just, and it is kind of fun and an escapism to get into uh, that sort of, you know, the head of, a, of that sort of personality just for the sheer, like, wow, that guy's, uh, that this is a different uh, perspective and it's fun to be in perhaps which is a way of saying it's you know it's it's not a disability because it can have its uses for focus right and um well yeah absolutely and 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 i i have to tell you that in the science and engineering and mathematics professions i think statistically in those fields there are a higher than average in the population number of people who are dealing with those issues with being on the autism spectrum and and I think um, these fields allow them some margin of, of uh, relief from the anxiety that comes with that because they're dealing with hard facts and numbers and often work alone as opposed to, you know, having to be forced to interact with people all the time. And I think that reduces yeah. the stress level a lot. And I think there's kind of a natural gravity toward that. Now, I'm not an expert in autism by any stretch of the imagination, but I did do a lot of research to better able to convey, you know, the character and, and, and where I wanted, mm-hmm. where I wanted him to go. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you did a great job. I'm, I, it, it really, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a wonderful character portrait in there as well. Um, so how do they get out there? So they have to go to the, this asteroid that they've found that, that looks very much like a spaceship. Um, how do they get out there? What's the, the, I mean, people need to go now, not just robots, right? That's right. That's right. Well, uh, in our ability today, we could be flying, what I'm actually working on a little bit in my day job, as I mentioned earlier, the nuclear thermal rockets. And, and basically, so people don't panic, this isn't the kind of rocket you'd launch from the ground. This is something you'd only use in space. And you would use uh, uranium fission to generate a lot of heat to uh, take the propellant and get it really hot to become your rocket exhaust. And, and the reason you do that is you get, for the same pound of fuel, you get twice the total uh, thrust, essentially, out of that. So it, it cuts your fuel mass way, way down. And any mission we launch that has people is really mostly launches of propellant. To go to Mars, you're going to have to have multiple rocket launches to get all the fuel in space just to take the spacecraft. And if you can reduce that number of launches from, you know, six to three, you can save a lot of money, and it's also faster to how you get there. So in the book, I'm postulate, positing that we developed this capability, and we and other countries around the world are using it uh, to actually send people to Mars and are exploring Mars using nuclear thermal rockets. And so in the story, when they have to go visit this asteroid and quickly get there to see what the heck it is, um, it's a repurposed Mars mission system where you, you would take that nuclear thermal rocket system and you would use that to send people. And that's totally viable. We, we could field those systems today if we wanted to do that. And, and I'm being optimistic that by 2060s, when the, when the book takes place, that we will have been to Mars a few times and we'll have a lot of experience flying these nuclear thermal rockets, at least within the inner solar system. They're good out to about Mars, maybe the main belt asteroids. Uh, to send people beyond that, you need something a lot better you need really nuclear fusion propulsion, which is how the sun operates, which is a lot more energetic. And that comes, that comes later, Mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. So you, you're saying right now we could off the shelf, uh, possibly uh, put together a fission, uh, a fission propulsion system in in orbit that would take us. That would be cool. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could do that. The technology was actually tested. This is, this is where you get a little bit embarrassed. Uh, it was tested in the late 60s and early 70s. And uh, with the cancellation of the Apollo program and NASA was uh, told by uh, the political leadership who directs what the civil space program does that we're not going to send people to Mars anytime soon, that was all shut down. And so that technology was essentially 
put on the shelf and has been for decades. The people that would be able to, to I mean, people that are thinking about it and know uh, about it are, for instance, people like uh, our friend Andy Presby, um, who is who wrote a he wrote a piece for us on the website about fish and rockets I, a couple of months ago as well he, he sure did and andy and i talk by at least talk by email pretty regularly about this kind of thing he's uh he understands the systems because of his background in the uh, nuclear navy and uh he's he's a he's a big advocate as well so people like that could could build these it, there's no reason we can't it's just a matter of doing it yeah. Well, what? All right. So uh, let's briefly talk about the political situation you posit. Um, it's not just, you know, we're, we haven't got to one world government of, uh, of Isaac Asimov's uh, wet dreams in 2060, right? I mean, it's, it's worse. Um, I have to tell you, uh, Tony, you and I've had this discussion before. For me, uh, my, my notion of the world becoming a more peaceful, unified world was shattered on 9-11 and the subsequent uh, polarization of the world with the, what we're experiencing now with the political situation with Russia and you got the rise of China. It's a pretty volatile world and I am not a pessimist. So people are, are not going to read my books and I'm, I'm not going to do dystopic futures, but I try to do realistic futures and any realistic future that I can imagine is going to have geopolitical challenges and risks. And so in the book, I posit a, basically a multipolar world. You have uh, what, you know, what we have as the U.S. and Europe and Japan as being basically as we are and prosperous economically and basically democracies. I, I posit that uh, China succeeds and puts themselves on the world stage as an equal player on the world stage. And they're not belligerent. They're just looking after Chinese interests, right, like we look after American interests. But I did do a little monkeying around with changes and I escalate the rivalry between China and Japan and uh, India, not Japan, China and India to be a uh, antagonistic rivalry. And that India uh, is, is the aspiring up and coming, not quite there yet world player and is not necessarily friendly to everybody else. And that there have been some conflicts between India and China over a very volatile border that they share. And they have had conflicts there in the past. And then the real wild card is I uh, threw in the, the rise of Islamic fundamentalism and that there would have, in fact be some sort of caliphate that uh, would be cemented in reality in a circumstance similar to what we're seeing with North Korea by basically this uh, caliphate becoming a nuclear state so quickly that it couldn't be stopped. And then once they're a nuclear state, you have to figure out how to live with them. So we have a pretty volatile geopolitical situation and unfortunately, while this is not the world I want to see, I can kind of see how this world could happen. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. why I put it in the book. So everybody's out to get there because you, it may be alien tech that will give them the, the decisive advantage over, over the competitors. Um, but there's also compelling reasons to go ahead. Yeah. There's also compelling reasons to work together if, if at different points as well. Well, absolutely. You know, it, when, when it comes down to it, we're all human. And, and I think that uh, it would make sense that when we find that there's something out there that's not of Earth and the, the news is almost impossible to keep secret, that those other nations who have a capability would all try to get there first to get the best benefit from it. And uh, so there would be a bit of a race to get there. And uh, I also believe that when circumstances warrant, even competitors can collaborate. And that's a, a scenario that I, I put in the book where competitors realize that, hey, you know, we might be better served if we stop fighting each other because the other guys over there are worse than both of us. And we need to need to cooperate to, to yeah. get there. So I, I try so to put a little you, bit of that uh, in there as well. How do you yeah. posit a alien AI? Um, ex what what would happen to it uh, over fifty thousand years? I I kind of think it might go a little bit insane, but um, yours is is less insane than <laughs> than what I, what I might picture. Tell us a little bit about Guardian of the Portal. 
um, as a character, perhaps. Guardian of the portal. Well, boy, you're jumping way out there. Um, the, the, you know, if you have a, if you have, how do I, how do I say this? When, when I think about identical twins that share the same genetics and are born within seconds or minutes of each other, and they may look alike, they may be genetically identical, but oftentimes, you know, and all the time, their personalities develop differently because of the environment they're in. And yeah. I have a, a family story about identical twins that were separated not in my immediate family, but cousins who were, who were separated in the 1930s because the parents couldn't raise, couldn't afford to raise both of them. So they basically gave one of the children away to another family. And so these uh, identical twins were raised under two very different family circumstances and actually met each other for the first time when they were just a little over 70 years old. And, and while they had a lot of similarities, their, their life experiences were so totally different. They were just two different individuals, right? So mm-hmm. in my mind, I was playing around with this notion that perhaps the AI that it is inhabiting this um, not asteroid might have another clone AI somewhere else that if they were cut off from each other for 50,000 years, they would develop very differently depending on the circumstances where they are and, and how they view the solar system and how they view their place in, in, in the world or the universe, right? And so yeah. I have more than one perspective from the AI. I have the AI perspective from, from one, and then it's, it's twin who 50,000 years ago, for reasons that are explained in the book, was cut off from its twin and had to develop on its own and have its own outlook on things. Yeah, this is very, this is, yeah, this is very cool. This is, uh, by the way, you do a uh, uh, point of view of Guardian, um, as the first chapter of the book, so it's not exa- you know we're not giving a spoiler here of uh, of anything, but um, it's there's a little bit of you know that, that sense of awe um, and and wonder uh, because you you do a good job of 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 presenting a, a, an intelligence that just knows a heck of a lot more than we do. Um, it's particularly when it when you show the scientist trying to figure out the stuff it is it it has told us right and 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 it would have to you know the one thing i had to assume so that you can have communication is that uh there'd be enough capability in this ai to know about humans uh to know about how we communicate and how we have basically developed civilization over the centuries. Um, But by the very nature of its orbit around the sun, a near-Earth asteroid comes regularly near the Earth. And so uh, if it has the right instruments and it's not damaged to the point over time that it can't get access to that data, I I can imagine that over 50,000 years, if you're an artificial sentient being, you, you might find it kind of interesting to study these developing humans on the planet and their, yeah. their rise and like, fall of civilizations. Like and if it's like having your own ant farm <laughs> or bee colony, right, because of the yeah. difference in technological levels, that's probably a very good answer. Very good analogy to give because uh, a lot doesn't happen on a very quick pace for us. But if you have, you know, patience of a being that can, exist for tens of thousands of years, uh, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire is just a blip, right? And be kind of fascinating to watch and what's happening in various parts of the world. So that, that plays into it as well. That's how it knows how, that's how communication can happen because even though it's very far ahead of us, it's been watching us for a long time and can figure out how it might interact with us. It might even have developed feelings <laughs> as one might for a pet or something like that. Of course. I love my dog. We've had her for 14 years, and she doesn't every, understand everything we do, and I don't understand everything she does, but I can understand it when she needs to go out versus when she's hungry, and I want to help her whenever I can. So, a- absolutely. That's true. Of course, your dog doesn't possess nuclear weapons yet. <laughs> but, but it, she, yeah, those are scary enough. So uh, tell us about some of the other technology that we might encounter. Um, the De Broglie, De Broglie communications for and gravity lenses and all. Uh, give us a, a little bit of uh, 
of a tour of some of the science we encounter? Well, in in uh, in science fiction that involves interstellar travel, to make it an exciting story, usually, but not often, because I think you can have exciting stories that are realistic uh, in terms of how long it's going to take to travel within the, between the stars, given our laws of physics, which basically say we don't think we can go faster than light. So there's a lot you can do within that. But typically, if you want to have interstellar empires and you know, aliens visiting the planet, you, you typically fall back to this notion of uh, travel at the speed of light or beyond it. And uh, so there are a lot of, of tropes in science fiction where you have like a stargate or something, and it gives you rapid travel through a wormhole or whatever somewhere else. But I, I think in this book, I've come up with a way that you can do it that I haven't really seen explained in any other science fiction novel. Um, and it goes back to a, a problem I had in graduate school looking at something called the de Broglie wavelength of matter. And um, Louis de Broglie, who was actually a prince, which is kind of interesting, he uh, was early in the development of quantum mechanics. And as people were playing around with this notion of quantum tunneling, which is basically how computers work, it's, it's if you have an electron and you have it, in a, have it trapped electrostatically in some potential will, that it doesn't have the energy to get out of. Um, if you think of it as a wave instead of a particle, there's, there's always a small part of its wavelength that extends beyond the edge of the potential well. So there's a, a small probability that that electron will relocate outside of the potential well, even if it doesn't, strictly speaking, have enough energy to get out of it. I'm getting pretty deep into quantum stuff, so forgive me. But Yeah. It doesn't actually tunnel. It just might be out there. Probabil it just might be out there. Right. Right. Probabilistically. Yeah. Relocate. It's called relocalization of the wave function, okay? And so it relocalizes itself from where it is to somewhere else. And most of the time, it doesn't get out of the potential well. It stays trapped in there, but there's some small chance that it'll go out there. Well, de Broglie said, you know, I think there's a wavelength for bulk matter, not just electrons and, and protons. And so he figured out that there are these things called matter waves. And the problem with those matter waves is that they're inversely proportional to the amount of matter present. So the, 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 the wavelength gets smaller and smaller depending on more mass that you have. And there was a problem I had in, in graduate school when I was studying physics where I had to figure out what was the probability of my desk relocating spontaneously to the other side of the room just through the alignment of its matter wave and the, the, look, the wave function just statistically, like the electron in the potential will, relocates pretty regularly to, to other locations, what would be the probability of all of the atoms in my desk at the same instant relocating to another destination? And the answer was, basically, it could happen, but it would take multiple lifetimes of the universe for the probability to catch up and, you know, be sure that somewhere in the universe that happens with all the matter in the universe. So it's, it's a really, really small probability, so small that it's, you know, not even realistically considered but it's not zero and so the science fictional trope that i use is some alien species figures out how to control the de broglie wave of a macroscopic object to relocalize it where they want to relocalize it and that's the the method of interstellar travel and i use the um the solar gravity lens as a way to enhance the effect and again this is all just speculation on my part yeah, you mean we can't do that now? <laughs> but what I'll say is the science is real. The science is yeah. real. Well, how how would a gravity? What's a gravity lens anyway? Cool to think about. Wow. Yeah, it is. Uh, these are real. Um, what happens is basically Einstein told us that uh, there is this thing called space time. And um, if you've seen some of the specials on Nova or the Science Channel or otherwise, our universe is pictured as like a, a rubber blanket. And uh, matter, and that's, that's vacuum of space, space-time. And matter bends that space-time. So it's like putting a, a bowling ball on your bed. It, it deforms the top layer of your, your bed sheets, right, to make a, an indentation. And so light which has to travel in straight lines through space-time, 
When there's no bowling ball, it goes through a Euclidean straight line like you would imagine just you know drawing a line on a piece of paper. But with the matter of the bowling ball there, the light bends around the bowling ball because it has to move through space-time, and space-time is now curved. So it travels through that curve. And then when it comes out of the gravity well, it keeps going in that straight line. Well, it turns out if you step back far enough from this massive object and you do a ray trace of the path the light is taking, it acts just like a magnifying glass. And there's actually a focus for those few light rays that travel just the right path around that bowling ball where the space-time is curved. They're bent just like light is bent uh, passing through a magnifying glass to the focus. And I admit when I was a, a boy, I you know fried more than my share of ants on sunny days with magnifying glasses. So I know about the focus of a, uh, of a, of a magnifying glass for the sun's energy. But it turns out uh, distant objects passing close to the sun, which is pretty massive, have their path bent. And there's a focus of these gravity bent light rays that exists in our solar system out beyond about 550 times the distance from the Earth to the sun. So the Earth-Sun distance is 93 million miles. That's called one astronomical unit, just to make it easy. Um, the uh, gravity lens is, is way out there at about 550 astronomical units. So five, I, th I may have misspoken earlier. It's like 550 times the Earth-Sun distance. And uh, this effect has been measured. Astronomers see the massive black holes in the centers of galaxies, magnifying objects that are behind them that would otherwise not be visible. It's called an Einstein cross. And again, you can go Google Einstein cross, and it'll tell you all about how that works. And if you go Google the solar gravity lens, you'll find, and go to the Bayon website. There's a nice article. that I wrote an article. I hope it's nice. Um, about Indeed. gravity lensing. So you can find out all about it. And, and I put in there that these, this uh, de Broglie wave travels through space-time. And in order to get it where you, you want to go, if you're traveling across interstellar distances, you need the solar gravity lens to focus your matter wave to transmit you yeah. across those distances. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the, uh, if we could somehow manipulate matter's uh, wave-like uh, reality... Um, the person on the other end would be destroyed because he would just relocalize, right, or whatever it is. <laughs> so. No, he wouldn't be destroyed. He would just appear there. It wouldn't be like the the right. the, the, uh, the, like the uh, uh, transporter. Made. No, 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 no. You, w it's not like uh, on Star Trek where McCoy <laughs> was worried about, you know, having his atoms destroyed and and rebuilt somewhere else. Very different. Yeah. This is actually saying that we will take. All of the atoms in your body, turn it and, and, and take that wavelength, which is you, your ensemble wavelength, and, and force it to its one of the most improbable locations that it would be, which happens to be where we want it to be. <laughs> yeah. And so basically, it just, you, you go, you pop, and you're there. That's yeah. the notion behind what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, that would be really cool. Why don't you, why don't yeah, you I, do I that? Love it. And then you have to worry about all these fusion <laughs> engines and all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish I knew how to how to do that. And if I did, boy, we'd we'd be on our way. But unfortunately, I'm just dreaming at this point. Well, some of the other technological stuff in the book is kind of cool. That is more. Um, uh, I like the flex craft idea. Um, is that uh, original to you, or is because it was a cool thing in the book? Craft is if, if you envision. Well, before I answer that, let me tell people what a flex craft is. The flex craft is essentially a, a single person hard shelled spacesuit that isn't like a spacesuit. It's essentially like a can that you go into without having to wear a spacesuit. You have external manipulator arms that you control, and it's like your own little personal mini spacecraft. It's sort of like um, like some of the submarines that have the, the manipulator arms that you see that were used to explore the Titanic and things, right? Yeah. And that idea was first put forward by Werner von Braun, uh, who was part of the German rocket team who came to the U.S. at the end of World War II and built a Saturn V. If you watch the original Disney um, stories about man in space that were done in the 50s and 60s that had von Braun, he actually has 
a little model in his hand that he holds up, which is, I think he called it the man in a can at that time, um, that would be that. And so that's a pretty good idea. It's been around for a while, but nobody took it seriously until a few years ago when I met a, a fellow here in Huntsville named Brand Griffin, who is a big advocate of the thing, and he called it a flex craft. Um, I'm not sure he came up with the term either, but but he's been a big advocate for it, and that's where I first learned of it, really cognitively. I may have seen it in the Disney movie, but I didn't rewatch. I didn't know that until I rewatched it after I'd been exposed to the flex craft. And uh, he's a big advocate for that, and and it would be a way to, um, you know, fly around the space station and do repairs without having to worry about all the pre-breathing and the the complex suit that you have, and you could have more than two hands. You could have five or six manipulator arms that are articulated on it so that you could have specialized hands for different tasks as you're out in your uh in your personal spacecraft so that was that was something i wanted to have used well there's all i mean it's just the the book is uh chock full of just cool ideas um what uh what are you working on at the moment uh les working with travis taylor where we are working on a novel of uh first contact involving a civilization arising at a nearby star at a time when we have the capability to actually go there. And in the story, there'll be a a compelling reason to go in that this civilization is in trouble. And unless we do something, since we finally have the capability to travel at at close to the speed of light, we're going to take a voyage to to go and help them out. And and what I'm looking forward to about that story and what we're writing into the story is we're going to play around with this notion of the rate at which time passes for individuals changing depend on depending on how fast you're traveling. And so we're going to have um, a spacecraft traveling near the speed of light for which the people on board, relative to those here on Earth, their clock slows down. And the rate at which time passes is different from the perspective of where people are, whether it be at the alien star system back on Earth or one of the ships uh, traveling. And so um, we're, we're going to play around with the effects on relationships, culture, politics, all that from relativistic time dilation. And of course, our hero will be stuck in the middle of it and having to deal with these complex hero or heroine. We haven't figured that out yet. We're just getting started about these complex relationships that will arise from that changing. So that, that's what I'm working on for Bain. And I'm also working on a, another nonfiction book about alien megastructures, um, which is playing around with Things like Larry Niven's Ring World and um, uh, the Dyson Spheres and looking in nature for examples of where that could possibly be used by future civilizations and how we humans are developing our own what I call killer structures, which are really lightweight but deployable huge structures in space that we'll be using in our development of the solar system. So I'm, I'm working on both uh, fiction and nonfiction again, which is kind of the place I like to be. Well, um, out now is Mission to Metheny by Les Johnson. It's, uh, it's a wonderful uh, uh, Clarkian, uh, um, big science, uh, just everything that, that you and I talked about when we said, what should Les do? This is the one, and you did it, and here it is. So, um, Les, thanks so much for being with us and talking about Mission to Metheny. Well, thanks thanks for having me, Tony. And I I tend to talk at length about things. I I hope people stayed with me. (laughs) This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leaden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior and challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corval's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mount armed attacks 
on others of Corville's traitors under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age and perhaps her very life is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. Chapter 25 The Happy Occasion, Langlast Port The flowers had been a gift, after all and Ms. Hartensis had been a good steward and made certain that the wine had not been overdrunk, which would have been an extra cask charge. The leftover breads, sweets, and vegetables would, Ms. Hartensis said, be packed up so that Patty might send them up to the ship. You have, after all, paid for these items, trader, she said. That was certainly true, though there was scarcely enough to feed the passage. And if they were to be made a gift to odd shift or maintenance. I wonder, father said, if there may not be a local public kitchen where those who are momentarily without means might find a meal. Forgive me if the question offends. But it was evident from Ms. Hortensis's smile that the question did not offend at all. In fact, the local corner kitchen would welcome these donations to their supplies, which we will gladly make in your name, traders. That would, I think, be the best use, trader, father said to Paddy, as if he were deferring to her. But, Paddy thought, he was deferring to her. It was her reception, after all, and her decision to make. She smiled at Ms. Hartensis. Please, if you would convey what is left to the corner kitchen, that would, as the master trader has said, be the best use. It shall be done, Ms. Hartensis said and nodded to her helper in his long white apron, who immediately moved to the bread's table. It was, Paddy said then, a very fine event, ma'am. I wonder, she hesitated. On this point, as on all others, she had done her research carefully, and knew herself on safe ground with the offer, yet the phrasing must not offend. I wonder, she said again, if I might give a gift in appreciation of your kind attention to us. The caterer colored somewhat, and Paddy felt a sinking sensation in her stomach. The world book did sometimes get custom wrong. And how, how awkward if this should be one of those times. But no, Perhaps it had merely been pleasure which had brought color to the other's cheek. She was bowing now, that strange and uncomfortable hinging at the hip that looked like a debriot move, only too quickly done and too stiffly held. You are all kindness, Trader Josgalen, said Unet Hartensis, when she had straightened out of her bow, a gift would find welcome with me. Hazenthal had Inky's file open on one screen, Tolly's file on a second, Nav up on a third, a research query line waiting on a fourth. Fifth screen, front and above, was traffic. Admiral Bunter limbed in green. Inky being young at her trade, she had included the names of those who had trained her to establish that she had been well-educated. This was in contrast to Tolly's file, which was fat with real accomplishment. She moved a hand to flip to the next page in Inky's file and paused, her eyes snagging on a particular sequence of words. Graduated with honors, Liar Institute for Exceptional Children. In memory's ear, she heard Inky's voice. And as one who has graduated from his own institute, though many standards behind him. Inky 
so Hasenthal was beginning to suspect, did nothing at random. It would not be going too far to suppose that she had deliberately set that piece of information out where Hasenthal might recall it at need. There only remained the question, had Inky planted a lie for her to recall, or the plain truth? No, no, Pilot has, Inky had chided her. If I hint you further along, I will do myself a mischief, which the directors would hardly care for. She recalled Tolly himself, answering her query into who she had killed for him. Both of them were directors, sort of the direct opposite of Pilot Tokel when it comes to matters of free choice. So, a match and an explorer's leap of intuition. Liar Institute for Exceptional Children. Her fingers tapped the words into the research screen. Calm chimed, message incoming. She extended a hand without looking and touched the proper key. Recorded message begins, came the flat tones of a non-sentient machine, quickly followed by Tolly's voice. Edged and cold, each word a blade struck from ice. Go home. I don't want you and I don't need you. Message ends. Hasenthal snorted lightly and tapped the line closed. The Liar Institute for Exceptional Children had multiple locations. She threw each into the NAV program opened a sixth screen, and called up Admiral Bunter's stats, compare and contrast with Terrigan's. This was the first time she had made inquiry into Terrigan's history and full capabilities. Perhaps she should have done so before. Such a lack of initiative would perhaps not show well should the captain ask for a report when she returned. However it was, she felt a shock of warm delight as Terrigan revealed herself now. Yes, thought Hasenthal, scrolling through the screens, Pilot Tokel had excellent taste in ships. Terrigan was a reconditioned scout survey ship meant to transport a team and equipment. Not so nimble as a single ship, but then Admiral Bunter was no scout ship at all. Admiral Bunter was a perfectly serviceable little freighter, solidly built and competently refurbished. Granted, his pod mounts were empty and he was traveling light, Tolly being no great weight. Even with those advantages, however, he was not quick and he was most certainly not nimble. If she knew for certain where he was bound with his prisoner, she might very well overjump him and be waiting at dock when he arrived. The Liar Institute held a hiring office on Vanachai. There was a secondary school, so-called on Anon, another hiring hall on Nostrilia, and the Institute itself on Liar Unthilon. Hasenthal fingered the keypad absently, considering the routes from Jemiatha's jumble stop to each. Inky was, she reminded herself, a subtle woman. But she was also a practical woman. If her intention was to ensure that Tolly came whole into the hands of the directors, Inky would not wish to give Tolly too much time alone with Admiral Bunter. She might be certain that her arrangements were as good as she could make them, but she could not be certain that they were proof against Tolly Jones, whom she styled, sincerely, so Hasenthal thought, the greatest mentor of the current age. She would therefore, Hasenthal reasoned, opt for the quickest route to a director that she might contrive. Hasenthal squinted slightly at the plotting screen, Nostrilia, a hiring hall at Nostrilia. Surely, if the whistle which rent Tolly's will from him were the common means of controlling unruly graduates of Liar Institute, there would be at least one director and one whistle at Nostrilia. 
One whistle, wielded by one knowledgeable director, that ought to be enough to imprison Tolly Jones within 1362. Hazenthal smiled, slightly, and without humor. Nostrilia it was then. There came a flare of green in the traffic screen, and she paused, looking up and sighing. Admiral Bunter had jumped. She took a breath and then recalled it was no matter. She would be waiting for them at Nostrilia. If she was right. If Tolly was still alive at Nostrilia. That was her greater fear, that he would act to keep himself forever free of the directors and their orders. He might well take his own life. She feared he might choose grace as his best course, but she did not fear that he would act immediately. Tolly, as his partner had come to understand him, was an optimist. He would attempt less final solutions to his situation before he embraced death. Possibly, he would even allow himself to be brought to the hiring hall itself in the hope that he might overcome the director. Such risks, as she knew, were not beyond him, and very often, they paid off. She would have to pin her hope on that aspect of his nature, and be certain that she was there, at his back, when he needed her most. And pilot Tokel, traveling, according to clever, subtle, and dishonest Inky, of her own will in that person's company? Pilot Tokel, as she had stated in her report to the captain, Pilot Tokel was very well able to take care of herself. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And shimmering little bits of nothing and something leaping in and out of existence in the vacuum between the stars. Possibly worth a billion zillion dollars and possibly worth the reliability rating of a Cold War era Skoda. Along with the thanks and praise of all the people made of regular star stuff for Les Johnson, author of Mission to Methany. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. 